Yeah, I think one of the most compelling things that I've been looking to you for uh, over the past couple of weeks in particular is what in the world you're thinking about the current state of this election that we're in, because it seems to be a roller coaster um, and it it's deeply concerning to see the direction and the division within the Democratic Party and uh, where the country is potentially going and the possibility that Trump could be reelected. So I just wonder at this top what you're thinking as you wake up this morning and are looking over the state of the Democratic Party and the country as we head into this election. Yeah, but what, what I'm thinking and what I'm hoping for is that the the candidate we nominate will will arrive and at that needed story for these times. And I think that's what's been missing. The uh, and, and having said that, you know, you know uh, there, there are a few people who can tell you, uh, as I can tell you, that running for president is really hard, and it's not easy, especially in in rapidly changing times, to arrive at that that new narrative that gives our country a shared sense of purpose, a sense of purpose that's not about a fear of the future, but about a hopeful embracing of the future. So. I do believe that uh, that we uh, uh, still have a chance to defeat Donald Trump. I'm not I'm not uh, totally pessimistic about that, uh, and I also feel very very firmly that the key to defeating Donald Trump is not to meet mean spiritedness with mean spirited, not to meet his fear with our different version of a fear not to meet fascism with socialism, but to create, uh, uh, you know, and, and not out of whole cloth, out of, out of facts and evidence, to create a story that underscores the truth of these times, that they are times of great peril. Uh, the, the, the possibility that we are uh, careening towards a sixth extinction event, and yet against that dark backdrop, the truth remains that no country is better situated than we are, as the United States of America is right now, to win this third industrial revolution, to seize all of the, the hope, technology, life-giving power of this shift to renewable energy, and to not only give our children a future with more health, more security, and more opportunity, but to save our planet. And that's an ambitious, uh, and that's an ambitious goal worthy of a truly great people. Totally. And what's compelling, so you're you're speaking, and it's the first time I can honestly say, watching the past few debates, that I've heard anyone articulate a hopeful future for the country, because most of our posturing right now is we are against Trump, or we're against Sanders, we're against Bloomberg, which there's conversations yeah. we had there. But... Why do you think it's so hard for people, especially those running for office right now, uh, not even just at the presidential level, but I'm seeing it at our local level here in San Diego, people aren't casting a vision of hope for the future. It's a reactionary vision only um, to what's been happening over the past four years. The, I think there's probably no one thing that's led to this combination of forces that has us almost addicted to the language and the politics of fear. Uh, I think a big part of it has to do with the, like how long do you have to unpack it, right, ma'am? Yeah. Uh, I think a lot of it has to do with um, uh, the degree to which the entertainment imperative, that is to say, uh, you know, the, the need for public discourse to be both exciting and mm -hmm. agitating. Uh, it's hard to stay on that stage, that debate stage, now that it's run not so much by the League of Women Voters, but by the wonderful world of Disney, if you cannot entertain and alienate uh, uh, sufficient numbers of people. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the reason why you have some accomplished governors or even U.S. senators that just could get no traction, could get no oxygen, couldn't get, couldn't get a, couldn't beg for a question or two with a tin cup on that stage because they don't, 
they don't excite as many people as they alienate. And if they did, they never would have been elected governor. They wouldn't have been successful as governor, and they wouldn't have been reelected as governor. So um, I think that's a part of it. I think the other part of it is the story is new. You know, the, all we've seen so far about the future, a uh, uh, global economy, uh, global warming, anything with a global adjective in front of it, global immigration, uh, anything with a global in front of it is uh, uh, conjures up uh, our most recent experience of, of doing worse or having less or losing something. And it stirs those emotions of, uh, of, of an aforethought of grief that, that the future is uh, a future of less for me, for my children. I mean, why is it that in a time of record low unemployment, you have record high white male suicides? Mm. The, the, the two are happening at the same time. Yeah. When I was campaigning for president four years ago, uh, mostly in Iowa, uh, I would ask the question, show of hands, how many of you believe very firmly that you've enjoyed a better quality of life than your parents and grandparents enjoyed? Every hand would go up. Then I'd ask the more difficult question. I said, uh, I would say second question, how many of you feel just as firmly that your children and grandchildren will enjoy a better quality of life than you have? People would kind of squirm around. They'd look at their shoes. They'd look around the room. Maybe only one or two people would raise their hand. They were usually younger, uh, uh, oftentimes people of color or new, new American immigrants. I was in China a couple of years ago with a nonprofit group, the East West uh, Foundation, whose job it is to foster better relations with the U.S. government and Chinese and political level and, and uh, you know, subnational level. And a member of the Politburo, who's in charge of their international programs, said to me through a translator at dinner, and this was very shortly after uh, Trump's election. Uh, he said, can I ask you something without intending any offense? I thought, okay. Uh, I thought he was going to ask me why Bernie took off and I didn't. And so I, I braced for the question through the translator, and this was the question. He said, explain to me how it is that Americans seem to have become so afraid of the future, because that seems to run contrary to everything we thought that we understood about the American character. Hmm. It's, a, it's a great question. Um, but the things that we must do, the actions we must undertake, the strategies that we have to embrace in a time of rapid change also themselves require change. Hmm. And they require a new vocabulary. Yeah. And we work out that vocabulary usually in the political arena, uh, that place where the future is always a story, and and so that's my long uh, that's my long sermon, Reverend, on on why we why we uh, have yet yeah. to embrace that more hopeful story of an American future. I think it's out there. This is what I found in campaigning for others in the midterms. The less and less and less I talked about Trump, and the more and more and more I talked about us yeah. and where we can go as a country, the more people listened. Yeah. And look, man, I'm not a I'm not a composer. I'm a folk singer. Uh, but that means I can recognize a sing along song when I, I hear it. And I could see people leaning forward, you know, tell me more. Yeah. Uh, phrases like uh, our parents. Do you think our parents and grandparents uh, didn't face times of rapid change, times of huge challenge, unprecedented? Yeah. Uh, they did. They faced these challenges, but they didn't they didn't. Uh, face those challenges by turning on one another. Instead, they turn to the future, shoulder to shoulder with their neighbors, realizing our diversity is our strength, and with a strong country at their back. They won the first industrial revolution. They won the second industrial revolution. Oh, by the way, along the way, save democracy for the world by crushing fascism and, 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 and imperial Japan. And they and they also built the broadest, largest, fastest growing middle class that any free nation on the planet had ever done. So don't tell me that we're not capable of facing changing times.
just as our parents and grandparents did, so too must we. And we must do so by looking at the hope we see in the eyes of our kids. Uh, uh, climate change is the greatest business opportunity to come to the United States of America in 100 years. If you're upset with income inequality, uh, you should be. It's not what other countries are doing to us. It's what we're not doing for ourselves. Mm. Our parents and grandparents did it. They always lifted up the minimum wage so it was above the poverty level for a family of two. They made sure that unions were protected, not smashed. They understood that working people had to have a, a fair and more equal voice at the bargaining table. And they also understood that bridges don't get stronger with age, they get weaker. And so they invested in infrastructure, not because they needed it for their own lifetimes, but because they knew their children and grandchildren would benefit from it in theirs. So please, spare me the pity party. Go take your cloak of fear. Toss it out the window. I don't want to hear it. I want to do for my kids and my grandkids like my grandfather did for me. Hmm. That's kind of the story. Um, yeah. And that's what I heard resonating all around the country. But in these presidential debates where it's all about shake them up like ants in a jar, make them fight each other, uh, it's, hard to, it's hard to get there. And then you have the phenomenon of Bernie. Uh, uh, we know from uh, Hamilton, the musical, uh, <laughs> that for every action in politics, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And there's a tendency for us to believe that with fascism running amok in the White House, that, that the most robust response to that is socialism. And, uh, you know, that, uh, that divisive force on the, on the, on the stage uh, also makes it very difficult for a more hopeful story to emerge. Because Bernie's story, God bless his heart, and he's been telling the same story for 50, 60 years is that it's all about the mean-spirited millionaires and billionaires. It's all about the bad banks. Uh, you know, it's the 1% of the 1%. They all need to be crushed. They all need to be tarred and feathered and ridden out of town on a pole. Uh, well, that's a, that's a story, certainly. And it certainly entertains and agitates large numbers of people. Yeah. Uh, but it's not really a, it's not a story consistent with our journey as, a, as the American people. Totally. Yeah, and what's compelling about that, I, th I keep using that language, but I think is, uh, I think of Rene Girard, this French anthropologist who writes about the scapegoating mechanism, mm. Also, uh, mm -hmm. Lee, which is also part of the Christian story. And it just, it seems like in this election, and I haven't been around for a ton of elections, so my memory is not quite as good about it, but it seems that in this election, we're really looking to try to find the person or the small group of people that are responsible for all of our problems. And of course, there is problems with um, corporate greed. There are problems with wealth inequality, and there are things that need to be reformed. But it seems as if, uh, not to go super spiritual here, but the Apostle Paul writes about, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers and principalities, this idea that it's not necessarily a few bad people that are causing our problems, but it's broader ideologies that are actually at work that are causing inequality and unjust ways of being in the world. And it's just, this is one of the reasons why I think faith has a role to play, at least in how we talk about where our politics are going. And it's why I'm so compelled by faith leaders who can, or by political leaders who can talk about faith in a compelling way because it's one thing to say that, yes, we can build a hopeful future based on our past and who we are as Americans. But if that doesn't have some sense of moral authority and grounding, if there's not right. reason to pull us forward, um, it feels a little hollow. And so I wonder why uh, you've been very forward. Our last conversation a couple of years ago was about faith and the role of faith and how you talked even on your campaign about in religious language. Um, we talked about Eucharistic and sacramental theology. Uh, you're the only politician I've ever met that can talk that. <laughs> <laughs> I miss my vocation. Yeah. <laughs> totally. but, and, and if I caught it, I wouldn't have four beautiful kids. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you made the right choice, I think. Um, but why do you think so many people are afraid to lean into the tools that faith gives us to articulate a progressive message and a hopeful message in the political realm? 
Whew, um, the when I was growing up in the eighties, coming of age, you know, young adult, college, and it was against a backdrop of faith and religion being hijacked for political purposes by the ultra. Uh, I don't know if we call them ultra then. We just by conservative political forces. Yeah. Uh, and there was a lot of scapegoating in that. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of kind of vilifying in the name of religion the the other and the motives of the other on on a whole range of issues. Some of them issues we might call cultural. Uh, all of them public policy issues that had to be worked out among people of many different faiths. And I think that because of that experience, a lot of us that lived through that in the late 70s and the 80s had developed a real disdain for the hijacking of, uh, and look, that's twice now I've used that verb, the hijacking of religion for the political purpose of demeaning, vilifying, or uh, uh, marginalizing others. So I think that's why. Um, I was fortunate as, you know, growing up, or moving, I moved to Baltimore after college at Catholic U and I was, and, and, and Baltimore is where I've lived my life and where I ran for office. And a majority African-American city, therefore, means that it's a, uh, a, a city where, where people more frequently go to church. And uh, I think, as I once heard one statesman say, if people, if African-American people uh, didn't have a deep abiding faith, they would not have survived what they survived. Mm. So that... That political environment, I suppose, gave me uh, freedom to be able to speak and speak comfortably and clearly uh, in terms that perhaps people in wealthy white suburbs would have thought was suspect and the use of religion as a substitute for reason. Uh, I never found it that way, but I, I did find it very useful. And when I ran for governor, I would always, my, see, my, whoever the speechwriter of the day was, would put in parentheses before talks, just in parentheses, Trinity with a small t. Mm. And that meant that I would, at the beginning of any talk, whether it was a ribbon cutting or a graduation or, or whatever it was, I would frequently say that for all of our diversity as a people, I'm always struck by just how much unites us. Mm. Importantly, these powerful beliefs, a belief in the dignity of every person, a belief in our own responsibility to advance the common good that we share, and an understanding that there's a unity to spirit and to matter, and that we're all in this together, and we need to help each other if we're going to succeed. It was usually some version of that, yeah. sometimes a little more uh, St. Paul than Frederick Douglass, but <laughs> it was... It was a kind of melding of, of both of those, those, those things. And I found that it transcended all religions. I could say it in a synagogue. I could say it in a Baptist church. I could say it in a, well, the, we don't let politicians speak in Catholic churches. Uh, but I could, I could say it in any place to people of any faith or those professing no faith. And I'd, and I'd see people breathe more deeply and almost open up as if to say, okay, tell me more. Where's this going? This is a little different. Yeah. And, and I found, it, it, was it different? I don't know that it was different. I mean, it's, I, I think it was just a lifting up in the public arena of the most important values we share is caring, loving human beings. Yeah, no, totally. And that's the thing that, again, as I engage um, both as a political activist and a social activist and as a pastor, I find that I think we've, so many Democrats have forgotten or progressive people in general have forgotten that America still is a country where a majority of people identify with a religion. Um, mm -hmm. We're still a country where maybe not in our big coastal cities, but in the Midwest, people have 
a faith undergirding for their values. And so when we're speaking about the political direction we want to take our country, to divorce that from the deeper values that so many, the majority of people in this country have, um, not to use religion as a tool to create different sectors as the religious right did, but as you said, these values in Christianity are the same values that every major faith tradition is espousing. And if we can talk in a language of faith, I think we can actually root our message and our vision for the future deeper in the hearts and the souls of people and actually, in my perspective, compel them to vote, compel them to show up and get involved in their community. And I think this election, we saw Pete Buttigieg do a great job talking about his faith in a compelling way. Um, we've seen Elizabeth Warren do that a little bit. But it really is still a pretty rare thing. And I do think, like you said, it's that fear of looking like or becoming the religious right. But there is a utility to the progressive people of faith and the large progressive movement of faith that has existed and does exist in our country. And I think just my hope is that progressive politicians will lean into that a little bit more and not fear it because our communities, like my church here, want to organize for the common good. But that can happen in conjunction with political leaders, but more often than not, uh, they're afraid to engage with us. So. Yeah, they, uh, and if you look at the founding documents of our republic, if you look at, if you look at the, the words and the phrases and the imagery and the values that Lincoln uh, invoked, uh, I mean, all of those are, all of those are time honored, uh, uh, spiritual concepts and language that that human beings have been have been working on and wrestling with and 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 embracing and using to get through a lot of tough times, whether it was slavery or or independence or two world wars. Uh, and I've, 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 I've that's some sometimes people. In the past, anyway, uh, I would be asked when I was in office, you know, to what degree uh, d does religion uh, affect your public, you know, your public performance or how you look at policy issues? And I said, well, I'll, I've always thought the question a little strange. I mean, it's not like I go to the closet in the morning and say, OK, I'm putting on my religious Martin and I'm going to work now as governor. Uh, or I'm leaving the religious Martin uh, here at home, and I'm going to go out the door as purely secular Martin. I mean, that's not how humans. That's not how we live, man. So uh, the answer is uh, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, sure, by the way I was raised, the values I share, and I think that's true of all of us. I mean, it's. Um, uh, so I don't know. I'm starting to drift off now. Bring me back. Bring bring me home, Robert. Yeah. Well, to kind of come to a conclusion, I do want to talk about um, Smarter Government, your new book, because it's super compelling um, that you are articulating a vision for the future of American government that takes seriously the use of technology to make government more efficient, uh, efficient and also about how we can empower more leaders in a more um, egalitarian sense almost, to bring more people into a sense of responsibility, um, working alongside public officials to lead. And so I wonder, one, why this book now? And two, do you see your vision for smarter government happening anywhere in American public life right now? What does that look like? Yeah, I sure do. Hold on a second, let me get, let me get the book since you're giving me a commercial, hold on. There you go. That was very authentic. That's why we do podcasts, right? Yes. There it is. It's a beautiful book. Yes, it is. Yeah. Smarter Government. So uh, thanks for bringing it up. Yeah. This was the book I wanted to write. It's not some whining, whinging diatribe against politics and entertainment culture and corruption and concentrated wealth. It's really about how to govern for results in the information age. 
And I was so fortunate, blessed, that while I had never run anything in my life before, you know, any large organization before being elected mayor in 1999, um, I had seen this new way of governing in the context of policing in New York with the NYPD and CompStat. And I was able to persuade the man that invented that system for Bill Bratton to come to Baltimore and to help me to be my mentor, to be my teacher, because having seen this new way of governing in action, um, uh, I, I concluded that this was the way our entire government should be run. And it was a curiosity to me that nobody else had figured out, uh, had done that yet. Um, I didn't do it to be clever, didn't do it to win awards, although we did win the Innovations in Government Award from the Kennedy School two years later. We did it because in 1999, my city had become the most addicted, violent, and abandoned city in America. More population loss in the 30 years leading up to 1999 than any other city in America, even Detroit. <clears throat> but while I served on the city council, I saw up the road in New York that every year, they were driving crime lower and lower and lower and lower. Even though in Baltimore, as we wallowed in excuses, crime was going higher and higher and higher and higher. So um, uh, this new way of governing is um, enabled, by, um, enabled by new technologies that most people today take totally for granted. We use every day as the conveniences of life. Uh, one of them is location technology, or GIS, Geographic Information Systems. The same systems that allow you to punch in an address and voila, magic. My adult kids think I'm a, a moron for thinking it's magic, but voila, magic. It'll, and uh, uh, so Geographic Information Systems, we also see it you know, when you call an Uber and a little car goes around the corner and you know it's three minutes away. We take that for granted. It's a big new thing, and it's a big deal for democracy and self-governance. The second thing is the internet and the evolving internet of things. These two technologies together give us as, a, as rational, self-governing human beings for the first time ever the ability to model, measure, and map dynamic changing human systems across our, our uh, physical environment, whether that physical environment is one city or one state or one's country, or one's planet. And, and that's a big deal. We don't need, in order to make our government work, we don't need new technologies. We need new socio-technical habits, habits of leadership, habits of management. Make no mistake about it. Uh, for all of the information we have and for all of the, the, uh, the new powers of these technologies that they give us, democracy's in a crisis. The world over, Chile, uh, England with Brexit, here with Trump, uh, even Ireland's recent election. Um, so democracy is in a crisis the world over, and the crisis is democracy itself, whether it can still deliver the things of, uh, of the public that make a republic worth having. Uh, so, uh, you know, Gallup polling does a... Uh, the same questions year after year, and they ask people about the level of trust they express in their government. And for the last 20 years, uh, trust in our national government, American trust in their national government, has been going down and down and down, 35%, all-time low. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, Americans express today a higher level of trust in their local government than they did 20 years ago during the same period of time. So what I've seen emerging from cities and, and, and counties well-led are those new leaders who are, are governing with openness, with transparency, using performance management to lift up the leaders, declaring public goals with public deadlines, and actually getting really difficult stuff done. Yeah. And they... In, in, the new game of, um, in the new game of democracy, uh, openness and transparency is the opening ante. Yeah. Uh, no longer do leaders have the authority simply because they sit high atop the 
pyramid of command and control, hierarchy, bureaucracy, the rule of because I said to do it. Instead, leaders in the information age are effective and get things done on an ever more broad and collaborative scale by putting him or herself in the center of the, of the collaborative circle, yeah. as close to the latest emerging truth as possible, and giving people the permission to ask the question, is what we're doing working or not? Is it working or not? Should we do it differently so it can work better? As well, you know, it's a fundamental, it's a big shift and it runs up against some of the old wisdoms of management and leadership in the public sector. And those old wisdoms say things like, you know, leaders should not share information unless they're forced to. Uh, leaders should never set public goals with public deadlines because what happens if you don't hit them? Your opponents will use it against you. Uh, Leaders also don't share information because your opponents will use that information against you. All of those wisdoms are out the window. Uh, the effective leaders I've seen in cities all across America understand, maybe at an intuitive level, if not in, a, in an articulated level, that they need to share information with context and narrative and the story of place, and they need to do it faster uh, and in ways that people can easily understand. And they do, need to do it faster than their critics. And, they, and I'm not talking about just open data, and, you know, indecipherable spreadsheets with lots of columns on them. That's, not, that's yeah. not what I'm talking about. It's not about open data. It's about the truth that as Americans, we have become a show me culture, not just Missouri, the show me state, America, the show me United States. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that's why I think you see the level of trust going up in local government. So in this, the reason I read the book was because I, I, I wanted to, uh, I, I wanted against this dark backdrop of distrust in government to show that actually a new story is emerging. Uh, it's a little softer, it's a little quieter than the angry, loud, polarized, fear-filled story of our national discourse. But it, but it's, it's happening almost like a, you know, a forest regenerating after a fire. It's all, it's happening all over the place. And I think the reason it's happening at the local level rather than the national is that local leaders provide very visible, tangible things. They never enjoyed that supposed power advantage of, you know, being high up in that hierarchy or in the ivory tower or on the whatever floor of, of city hall. I mean, the alley's either cleaner or dirtier. There's 20 guys on my grandmother's corner where there used to be two slinging drugs, or there's two where there used to be 20. You know, that you can't. So because mayors have never enjoyed that advantage of holding or hoarding information or keeping the public from knowing, I think they've been much more uh, keen on, a, on adopting customer service technologies. Uh, 311 is an example of this. All across the country, uh, most major cities now have one phone number to call for all city services, and every citizen, Reverend, gets the same customer, gets a customer service number that is unique to the individual, but everybody gets the same time frame within which to expect that pothole will be filled, or the swings in the park will be fixed, or whatever the service need is. Yeah. That's a big deal, and that's also a shift, because in the past, yeah, in the world of patronage politics, you know, the, the places that voted for the mayor in the greatest numbers were the ones that got the best services. Or wealthier people got one level of service and poor people, sorry, we don't have enough police officers for those neighborhoods. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's why I wrote the book. And I laid it out in such a way that I, I hope it's, it speaks to people throughout the country. Um, the chat, it, it traces the evolution from Comstat um, time and uh, to city stat to state stat and then the individual deeper dive chapters are on public safety, public health, public education, and then land, air, water. It concludes with the American Revolution and our world and the sustainable development goals for the planet, which also depend on our ability to model, to measure, and to map. <laughs> So uh, that's, that's the book. Can I just, uh, and you can, of course, have the power to, to do many things, including to cut down my answer in the edited version of this. Uh, 
but I just wanted to describe one piece of this that a lot of people miss. Uh, in the book, you'll see a lot of kind of dashboards and maps and charts and graphs. I tried to lay it out. The inspiration was to lay it out almost like a, an article in Vox or something, you know, so it's, uh, you can get the gist of the book. There's a graph moving in the right direction, right? Uh, so you can kind of get the gist of it if all you were to do was to there you go and a map, yeah. And the kidneys of death in Baltimore being shrunk over time, um, but but there's a piece of this that that a lot of people miss, even well-intended mayors and governors that say, "Oh, I like the dashboard. Oh, I like the map. Oh, I like the idea of open and transparent, you know, data shared by all." Uh, what they miss, though, is a, a really important piece of this, without which, you know, progress is impossible. And, and it is the regular convening and reconvening of that collaborative circle to focus on that latest emerging truth, whether that truth is in eradicating childhood hunger or restoring the health of the Chesapeake Bay or whatever the challenge is, you know, people, human beings work against deadlines. And the way government's always been set up, at least, you know, always 240 years always, annual budgets and inputs. Jack Maple, who was my mentor in this, the man that invented Comstat in New York for Bill Bratton, said, um, do you want to make, uh, do you want to make progress of one or 2% annually? I'm like, well, that would certainly be an improvement over where we've been the last 10 years. He said, no, uh, hear me out. Do you want to make one or 2% progress annually, or you want to make one or 2% progress every two weeks? Hmm. Well, I wasn't a math major, but I said, hey, I want to make one or 2% progress every two weeks. Hmm. He said, then you have to create a cadence of accountability and collaboration that has people working together against two week deadlines. Hmm. Uh, not just navel gazing or staring at the lagging indicator, but actually asking the hard questions every two weeks about how we're doing, what we're doing, the leading actions that leverage you to the big goal. Uh, so that was CompStat, timely, accurate information shared by all, rapid deployment of resources, effective tactics and strategies, and relentless follow-up. Those were kind of the four tenets of CompStat. And the conversation happened in the round with the commander from a local police precinct or, or maybe the borough of Queens even, uh, there at the ta one side of the table with his or her command staff and around the other side of the circle were the citywide uh, uh, people, the head of detectives, head of warrant service, uh, head of patrol. And uh, for one blessed hour, you lock the whirlwind of the latest scandal or the events of the day out outside the door and you focus on how we can do what we, are, we can do in order to achieve uh, the big goals we've set for ourselves. Um, so uh, the, the cadence of, for all of the things that leaders have lost in the information age, like the, the ability to hoard information or hold on to information, there's a power that's still reserved to the leader and only to the leader, and that is the power to convene and the power to focus, especially if it's people who serve at your own pleasure as a, as a mayor. Uh, so, uh, so that's the book, and it's been well received by practitioners, and, that, and that's my, my greatest hope, uh, is that it's of use and of service to all of the young people who are discouraged by their nation's politics, but nonetheless follow their heart to go into government, and a lot of them are going into government in cities. Uh, and also large counties. And, and I think soon you'll see this new way of governing jump to states. It's been slower than I thought it would be for states. It went kind of horizontal among cities early, um, but with states, it's still lagging a bit. Yeah, totally. And I'll say as a political science student, the first three chapters that I've read are much more compelling than most of my textbooks. So I hope more people will read this. This isn't it is technical, but it's written in such a way that it is a lot more compelling than just some government book. So I yeah, do. you know, one one of my Jesuit priest friends said to me, Martin, uh, you need to teach a course three times before you understand what you're talking about. So I taught 
I taught a course in public administration, three different iterations. Uh, and uh, the last one, I really started to get the language down in, yeah. in ways that weren't wonky, that were open. And, and I figured out which stories actually work and teach and entertain and tell and which ones I just enjoy remembering. <laughs> so so I, I uh, uh, thank you. The kids in, 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 in the courses seem to like it. I, I found in my own political science courses, a lot of it was theoretical, man. I mean, uh, Plato and Socrates, yeah, I'm down with it. That's great. But how are we going to, how are we going to accomplish real and tangible things? Uh, so it, it, it is a, it's, it's practical. I think it's a new genre. Reverend, it's a, it's not exactly a text and it's not exactly a memoir. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of a combination of the two and there's some heroes and there's some protagonists yeah. and uh, not a lot of villains. Yeah. <laughs> not, not a lot of villains. The culture of excuses is the villain. Totally. Uh, the, the culture of disbelief is the villain. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, thanks for letting me talk about it. Yeah. No, and I just wanted to say thank you. I mean, not just for your time today, but I do think that you're articulating a vision that is positive and hopeful and also giving answers that are forward looking, which again, doesn't seem to be happening at least on the, from the most loud voices on the national scale. And so I just am grateful for your voice in this world and hope that it can get some amplification, especially as we keep moving towards what I hope is a better future for our country and for the world. Yeah, me too. Hey, since we're since we're here in my space, and since this is since we're allowed to speak spiritually, hold on a second. Yeah. It's my hero, Teilhard de Chardin. Yes, he's my such a good writer. So, I love his vision of progress and uh, being pulled towards progress is something I wish more politicians would lean into. Yeah. It's beautiful. So let's so let's wrap with Teilhard de Chardin, who said there is an absolute direction to growth and life moves in that direction and life is never mistaken about its road or its destination it tells us towards what point on the horizon we must steer if we are to see the dawn's light grow more intense i love it and i love it too <laughs> oh well <laughs> okay thank you so much governor it's good to 